Galileo's daughter was just nine years old on a November night in 1609. That was the evening when Galileo first pointed his new spyglass at the moon setting behind the hills of Padua and began to sketch what he observed. It was the start of eight weeks of sleepless nights spent in his tiny courtyard, suddenly transformed into the world's premier astronomical observatory. From my observations, I have been led to the opinion that the surface of the moon is not smooth, uniform, as a great number of philosophers believe it and the other heavenly bodies to be, but is uneven, rough, and full of cavities and prominences, being not unlike the face of the earth, relieved by chains of mountains and deep valleys. The moon Galileo saw was Earth-like, and he sketched its features with Earth-like detail. If the surface of a heavenly body resembled the Earth, perhaps the heavens and Earth were not as different as everyone thought. Galileo had observed the moon through a series of phases, and he apparently made some adaptations to uh, his instrument and uh, began ex exploring the planets. Now, Jupiter was the one that was in the most favorable position for observation. It was closest to the Earth at that particular point. And when Galileo looked at Jupiter, he saw three very bright little stars, invisible with the naked eye, on a line with Jupiter. And he remarked on that. He had no idea what they were. I mean, he thought that, of course, they were what they used to call fixed stars. In other words, the things that we call stars. But then, since it's such a remarkable configuration, he came back to it the next night. And, well, yes, there were still three stars, but their relative position to Jupiter had changed. And so within a week, he realized that what we have here are moons of Jupiter. Like the moon goes around the Earth, these moons go around Jupiter, and there are four of them. Four planets, never seen from the beginning of the world, right up to our present day. These wandering little stars make their journeys around the planet Jupiter with a marvelous speed and with mutually different motions, like children of the same family. In a little more than a week, Galileo had found the first new astronomical bodies to be discovered since ancient times. This discovery, clashed with the common belief that the heavens revolved around the Earth alone. Eventually, it would bring him head to head with church dogma. But for now, Galileo was exuberant. He rushed into print because he knew he could get scooped. If we date the discovery from the first observation of Jupiter's satellites until he realized they were moons, uh, January the 7th to January the 15th, he was in print by March the 12th. The book was out. Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger, was an enthusiastic announcement of telescopic astronomy. The first printing sold out within days, and news spread across Europe of Galileo and his amazing telescope. Galileo became an advocate for his new astronomy and for scientific observation. But as his fame spread, so did his reputation for arrogance. Sir, your ignorance of astronomy confounds me. I think if you spat on the ground, you'd see a new star in the shine of your own saliva. <laughs> well, as for you, my lord, I'm astonished that you persist in trying to prove something to me with the testimony of expert witnesses that I can perfectly well find out for myself with a simple experiment. It's witnesses, witnesses, and uh, uh, useful, of course, in difficult matters in the past. Uh, I mean, a judge might, for example, call a witness to establish whether Luigi stabbed Giovanni, but he's not going to call a witness to establish that Giovanni was stabbed at all because he's got the wound in front of him. Do you, do you see? He could see it with his own eyes. 
modesty never came easily to the young professor. I render grace to God that it has pleased him to make me alone the first observer of an admirable thing kept hidden all these ages. By making the invisible now visible, the telescope was starting to revolutionize astronomy. From ancient times, astronomers had tried to account for the observed motions of heavenly bodies by assuming that they were attached to transparent crystal spheres, rotating sphere within sphere. The Greek astronomer Ptolemy worked out the system in great detail to explain the motions of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, all that could be seen with the naked eye. At the center of Ptolemy's intricate system sat the Earth, solid and unmoving. The Ptolemaic system was filled with ingenious geometrical devices. It made it possible for people to compute where the planets were to be, and this was useful, let us say, uh, for astrology. Uh, it was useful if you just wanted to keep track of where things were in the sky. But it wasn't perfect. Sixty years before the telescope, a Polish clergyman, Nicholas Copernicus, noticed that the calculations needed to predict the positions of the planets in the sky would be simplified if he assumed that the sun, rather than the earth, were at the center of the universe. Copernicus described the sun as though on a royal throne, ruling the planets that circled around it. It was a wonderful system aesthetically. For decades after his book, most astronomers simply suspended judgment. The reason was that there was no observational evidence that the Earth moved. In fact, it seemed almost silly that the Earth moved. In the Copernican system, the Earth was never still. It had two separate motions, revolving around the sun each year and spinning on its axis once each day. Copernicus was a little bit reluctant even to publish his system because he figured there would be a lot of criticism of it. The thing that Copernicus suggested just made him really the laughing stock of Europe because he was saying here is the Earth is actually whizzing round at a huge speed, about seven or 800 miles an hour. That's just going round on its axis. And in addition, it's going round the sun at about 30 miles a second. I mean, they were saying, this is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, look at the ground. It's as solid as you can see. Clearly, the Earth is not moving. Nothing could be more obvious than the fact that the Earth isn't moving. If it was moving, everything would be flying off it. I mean, church steeples would fall down, birds couldn't keep up with it, clouds would go disappearing over the western horizon and things like this. Galileo had read Copernicus and already suspected that the Copernican system was correct. But even with his telescope, he did not see a way of proving that the Earth moved around the sun. First, he would make a move himself, back to Tuscany, the land of his birth. Florence, the Tuscan capital, held a great attraction for the rising young star. The exalted home of Dante and Michelangelo, Florence had been ruled for centuries by the Medici family. A source of great wealth and power, the family dominated banking and commerce and was influential in church matters. The spheres of the Medici coat of arms adorned palaces throughout the city. For Galileo, there could be no greater honor than to have as a patron Duke Cosimo de' Medici. Galileo is looking for social improvement, and he has tried several times to get patronage from de' Medici, and here he sees his ticket. The Grand Duke of Tuscany is one of four brothers. Galileo has discovered four moons around Jupiter. Uh, shrewdly wants to name him after his prospective Medici patrons. A copy of the Starry Messenger, Galileo's finest telescope, and a personal plea are dispatched to Florence. It is up to our sovereign whether I spend the rest of my days here in Venice or return to Florence. If I'm to return, I desire that your highness shall give me leave and leisure 
without my being occupied in teaching. Finally, I desire of His Highness that in addition to the title of mathematician, he will annex the title of philosopher. Galileo points out how bad his position is at Padua, how he doesn't have any time for research, how he's overrun by students, and what he would like would be to serve a great ruler and to do research. A few weeks later, a letter was issued from the Medici offices at the Uffizi, inviting Galileo to join the Medici court as mathematician and philosopher. Here he would be at the center of Florentine intellectual and social life.